Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this timely debate hosted by Erective Education for a Sustainable Future, supported by Life Terra as part of the EU Green Week. On Twitter, that's the hashtag EA Debates. My name is Nicholas Kurmeyer, an energy and climate journalist based in Berlin. I'll be moderating today's debate on how we can empower individuals to, to tackle climate change through education. Uh, we, as a species, face an enormous challenge, the climate crisis. Education plays a critical role, not only by raising awareness, but also by boosting climate literacy, educating people on sustainability, training them in green skills, think the skills needed to install heat pumps, as well as community building. Climate science can be a lot, and finding trusted sources of information may be challenging. Trusted educators can equip individuals with the knowledge and understanding of the science of climate change its impacts and the ways in which individuals and communities can take action to address it. To start your day off, enlightenment is man's release from his self-incured tutelage, Immanuel Kant once said. Being better educated about climate change means that citizens are far more likely to understand the problem and are empowered to make changes in their own lives. But how do we do that? What is the most efficient way to equip today's youth with the skills needed? That is what we were discussing today. And we have an esteemed panel to be discussing these questions, as well as a way for you, the viewer, to participate in the discussions. This is the Slido QR code, or you can go to slido.com and enter the hashtag education. So there's two hashtags. There's hashtag EA debates on Twitter and hashtag education on Slido. If you want to talk about the event, if you want to pitch in, those are your two ways to get your voice heard. And with that, I'm very pleased to be introducing our panel of four speakers, starting off with Michael Teutsch, uh, the head of unit at the European Commission School and Multilingualism Office, that's DG ESA. Then we have Tremor Denigo, a European education expert at the Education for Climate Coalition and of the GSC, the EU's research arm. Please also welcome Adelaide Charlier, a climate and social justice activist who co-founded the Youth for Climate Belgium movement. And last but not least, Miriam Molina Ascanio, a project and pedagogical coordinator at EUN, the European Schoolnet. Having introduced them all, I'd welcome you, Michael, to get us started with a quick introduction and then we'll go in order of introduction, please. Yeah, thanks a lot, Nico, for the welcome and uh, for the invitation here. Very happy to be here. Uh, what are we talking about here? Today we have uh, a really a big challenge ahead of us where really everybody is concerned. So which is why also education has to play its part in it. And this is also why um, education is also part of the major initiative that uh, this commission under leadership of uh, Ursula von der Leyen and also Mr. Timmermans, vice president, has taken to, 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 to work for a whole transition of our economy, society, the Green Deal. And education has a small but very important part uh, to contribute uh, to that. Um, it's also clear that education is decided by member states, but the member states have said, uh, have put green education, green education for the sustainable future into the EU strategy for cooperation on education. Uh, so they, they also share the interest. Uh, what we see is that a lot has happened um, uh, at country level in, in promoting green education and uh, education for a sustainable future. But of course, uh, much more still needs to be done so that this is uh, mainstreamed. Uh, what, what's important is there we have to, of course, uh, prepare learners, people uh, to live under these new conditions, to give, to empower them to, to live in this. And education systems themselves um, have to look a bit at their operations. Maybe last point uh, to mention, so what does it mean actually good climate education? I mean, it's very much hands-on, it's very much good education, practical example combined with knowledge and competences. I think that we can make a good way forward. Thanks a lot. Tremor, please. Well, we'll be skipping you, you for a second. 
Okay, so we want me to, to make my statement. So I will try to um, want to share with you the idea, which is uh, kind of uh, evident that uh, at the moment, all countries in the world, and that's the case in the EU, are facing the same challenges uh, at the same time, which is something which is uh, very interesting. They are all trying to adapt their education and training system to uh, the need, of course, of a transition, because they want to equip the citizens and the professionals we need. Uh, the thing is that many education systems are a bit outdated, are a bit struggling. They are based on uh, something in inherited from the precedent uh, revolution, as uh, industrial revolution. And uh, if we need education for the transition, there is a need for a transition in education. So as Michael was saying, many, many activities are going on. Uh, a lot has happened, but a lot is currently happening in the education system, but uh, of course, uh, Absolutely excellent. There's a, certainly a political momentum in change uh, introduced in the education system, but there's still a lot to do. So we need to engage more than ever in a very lot of conversation in order to share ideas and share good practices and to engage in uh, co construct solutions together and go beyond barriers of all types. So between the countries, but also between regions, between also the schools, between the education levels, between professional categories, because we need also students, teachers, and the stakeholders to, to work together policymakers also with practitioners to be sure that we come up with solutions that do really uh, make a change so this is the spirit of uh, education for climate coalition which is the european participatory community to support teaching for learning uh, for the green transition and stable development facilitated by the european commission and we are trying together to build up capacity to strengthen our capacities in order to accompany the change that has to happen. Join us. Adelaide, please, if you would. Yes. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Good morning. It's great to be uh, with you all today and to talk about this topic that is crucial. I am still a student, so uh, obviously this uh, is uh, very important for me and very important to also include students in these conversations. Um, but I am most importantly a climate and human rights activist. That's uh, what takes most of my time during the day. And actually, this is sadly where I get most of my education on uh, the topics relating the um, boundaries of our planets that we are crossing and uh, the challenges that we are facing as a society, as a European Union. This is in this part of um of my activities that I figure it out. So this is where we see that there is still a lack of presence of disinformation in our educational system. Um, and I think it's great to talk about how we continue to implement this in all programs on our intersectional level. Uh, how do we make sure to refer to, for example, the climate emergency, not only as something that is for scientists, for example, for people or students who love science, but actually for all students, no matter what they love, no matter where their talents are. Um, and I think there, maybe where the conversation is going to start to be interesting here is how do we empower now students to make sure that we go from having the information, being conscious about this issue, and then translating that into concrete action. And I think for my side, but we'll discuss this more, this has to include uh, a project that goes beyond the individual action. We need to bring back in schools, in, in programs that concern climate change, we need to bring back the sense of community, of working together for a, a project that goes way beyond who we are as an individual, but that can have a very strong impact if, as an individual, we are part of the project. So I'm excited to talk about this with you today. Very nice. Thank you. And last but not least, Miriam, please. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, well, for me, uh, teachers are the true leaders in this green transition. Uh, because teachers have the power to educate and also to inspire future generations. And at European Schoolnet, we are very proud to be a partner in the Life Terra project, uh, who is organizing this event together with your active. And I'm personally very proud because we are creating materials, we are creating training and many opportunities for educators because these educators are the ones shifting society to, uh, towards a more uh, sustainable future. And we should help them. We should help teachers in this mission to empower the youth to take uh, climate action 
uh, to learn not only about nature, but in nature, hands-on. Because teachers play a crucial role. We should not um, leave them feeling alone in the classroom. The whole education community, the whole society should be supporting teachers in, in their mission to place sustainability in the hearts of students from a very young age. Because I also believe uh, that the younger we start, uh, the, more, the better results we will have in the future. So very excited to be talking about all these topics uh, uh, with all of you today. Very interesting point. I think we'll be coming back to that. Sadly, I've just been informed that one of our panelists, the European lawmaker Romeo Franz from Germany, could not make it. Having said that, I think we've broached on a lot of topics, but just quickly to get us started. Michael, you quickly noted the fact that there are certain initiatives that are being done at the EU level, despite the fact that ultimately education is a member state competence, right? Could you quickly brief us on what those are and what they, how long they've been and what they've achieved? Well, thanks a lot. With pleasure. Uh, listen, the, the good news in all this is that it's not that we have wonderful examples across the European Union that that uh, where people are working on it that that are done very well. Uh, the bad news is that it's very often a bit marginal and done by a number of people, but but not sort of across the board. So the idea is now, and that's what uh, we've discussed in the Commission and with Parliament and with member states, I mean, how can we support that this is sort of done more widely? Um, different elements. So first of all, I mentioned the overall education strategy. Then uh, we have from the commission uh, and from, from, from the member states, the council has then adopted it. Uh, what we in our wording call a council recommendation on a strategy for education for sustainable development and, and the green transition, where we set out what could be done uh, by member states in order to promote that such education is being more widespread. We've collected good practices from, from, from countries where they exist. And now the council has decided if anybody in the member states wishes to take this very seriously, here is what you could do based on the experience uh, that we have from countries and uh, that we have from good projects like we support them in the Erasmus Plus program. So this is a bit the, the top down approach. Uh, any country, any region that would like to decide this is important for us politically, we would like to do it um, um, I mean, across the board. Here is what we call a, a council recommendation with a strategy that you could implement. So that's something the council has decided. So that's a bit the top-down part, uh, the policy part. Uh, the, the Then, as, as uh, Tremor already mentioned, it's important to also um, work sort of bottom-up. I mean, we've, that's why we created the Climate Coalition that he's running, so that projects um, uh, um, do it uh, together. And that's why we also support many, many projects under the Erasmus Plus program. Um, to make the program itself more sustainable, because of course with mobility we also have a leave a climate impact, but also we support many schools who are testing what can I do. We do it with Erasmus, we do it with e-twinning, uh, with other things. And then um, maybe also some work, because it's all fine to have a strategy, we need some more tangible tools. I mentioned the programs, I mentioned the, the um, the the up to uh, bottom up uh, projects but we also have a bit more specific tools i would like to mention here a competence framework for climate um, uh, education where we try to develop a bit more detailed what does it actually take to know about what's happening to take action i mean as adelaide has said uh, it's really important where do i hear about this uh, and also where teachers if they think about their teaching and what are the things I should perhaps uh, think about in, in what to teach and how also to teach it so that, that, that the things are done. Um, so this is a, what we call a, a competence framework for, for education. And we work, and last point perhaps to say that if when we work with this recommendation, it's all fine, decided by the council, but then we also discuss it uh, in the current at the moment with the colleagues interested from the countries with stakeholder organization uh, on exchanging issues what does it actually mean to teach it i mean we just had a peer learning in a school in ireland to see how does that school organize it how they would i help how do they support their teachers um, we look at how can it be included in assessment in exams for example how do you do such exams so very specific points that we try to help those who are interested to moving ahead Okay, thank you, Michael. Um, I think 
you've broached a very important topic, right? And I think it's crucial to education that teachers matter a lot, right? Tremor, if I were to ask you, could you brief us a bit on, do you have any data or experience on the outcomes on how teachers drive education outcomes, right? Like Miriam started it earlier, teachers are the end all be all in education, right? But you from the scientific community side, what's your analysis? So when it comes to um, trying to change an education system, obviously, and Miriam is absolutely uh, true, the role played by teachers is key, which is why all international organizations will tell you that uh, one of the first leverage is teacher training. And we need to, to, to teach trainers, uh, to, to train the trainers. Uh, UNESCO has shown that also very clearly with the surveys they've, 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 been, uh, they've been doing where you can see that uh, the large majority of teachers are asking for more training because they want to do more on green education, but they feel that they don't have the, uh, the means and they don't have the knowledge um, enough uh, to be able to tackle that issue. So that's something we really have to hear. And uh, we've got to think about uh, providing uh, teachers with all the support we can, which is certainly based on content, but not only. That's the second point I want to, uh, to tackle. Um, I think Michael and Miriam will, will tell us the same thing. I mean, all the teachers I'm in contact with were, were, of course, having a lot of conversation with other actors. And mostly uh, the teachers I'm meeting from uh, various countries and are, are telling me the same thing. I mean, we are convinced we need to do more. We are acting, but in most of the cases, what we're doing is something that happened exactly like Michael said before, on the side. Sometimes you even have teachers who are telling you that they're doing that on their free time uh, as an extracurricular activity. So if we want to make a change, and we want to make a change, we need to embed sustainability within the education system and give the teachers the place to really act. And not act just on an individual basis, as sustainable education is very much about team teaching, it's about transdisciplinary. So we need to give the possibility to the teachers to work together uh, uh, and to um, focus much more on experiential uh, learning, as Michael was saying, and, uh, and also project-based learning, in a way to give them the possibility to really uh, implement solutions, which is far to be the case. And let's be frank, really, uh, today, even if there are a lot of initiatives and a lot of awareness, that's true, which is raising in the education system, they understand that they need to, to do more. And I will finish by that, uh, uh, Nico, but... Uh, we tend to think uh, sustainable education as a box, you know, I mean, we've got a, a very complex architecture at the education and training sector. Uh, uh, and then we say, okay, now we got also to think about green education. So let, let's add a box. Let's add a stone to that big, you know, uh, building. It doesn't work like that. Sustainability is something which is fully transversal. So when it comes to teachers for students or at the system itself, we have by definition to embed sustainability within the system, which means uh, reforms and changes that are much more ambitious in a way that just, you know, uh, for instance, uh, having a course dedicated on sustainability with the teachers uh, that are specialized on that. No, it's much more than that because the philosophy teacher, the biology teacher, and the English teacher together can work uh, on sustainability. What, like, let's maybe ask you first, Miriam, but if one of those three teachers does not believe that man-made climate change is real or thinks that it's going to be much less impactful than some may fear. Does the whole system just break down? Is there anything in place to combat, for example, like should education professionals be held to a higher standard when it comes to, for example, uh, educating on the facts of man-made climate change than other professions? Is, there, is that something that you're concerned with? Because what if they do? Absolutely. And I think this goes back to uh, teacher training in the first stage. I mean, uh, we are all going through through school, uh, we have different teachers, and then finally we choose a profession and some of them are going to be teachers themselves. They go to university and what we are learning, uh, well, I, I was a teacher uh, before joining European Schoolnet, so I talk about from experience that what you are learning at university is very distant from what is happening in the classroom. And um, I think uh, sustainability is not really taught in a, a, a transversal way, like uh, Tremur was uh, saying before, it's like a box. It happens 
uh, you might teach about it if you are a biology teacher, perhaps, but if you are in primary, in, in early childhood education, it, there, there's not a lot of emphasis on this. And then even though if you are a secondary teacher and you are interested in teaching about this, there's no time and it's very difficult to collaborate with your colleagues and, and to create and to create a, a project um, among yourselves. So I think we have different issues uh, depending on the level of school in secondary. They might have the knowledge and perhaps a bit more the confidence on teaching sustainability, but it's difficult to collaborate. Whether as in primary and early childhood education, well, one teacher is usually most of the time with, with the classroom. So they have the time, it's easier to collaborate, but perhaps they don't have the training, they don't have the confidence to, to teach also in an age appropriate way about these issues. So I'm reading you as elementary to school teachers should first read Club of Rome and then tell the kids about it to boil you down quickly, right? But Adelaide, as the person who's most closely connected to the education, would you say that that is something that you've experienced or that you've heard of, that people are being taught about sustainability by their teachers? Have you even heard it from your biology teacher? Because I didn't hear it from mine, personally speaking. Mm -hmm. Um, so I left elementary school quite a long, a long time ago now, um, and, and high school a bit of time. But um, but as a student, actually, what I've realized um, to tell you a bit my my little story, I had a part of my educational uh, of my education which uh, was at the United Nations School in Hanoi for five years, and there I really it was included in all programs, no matter what uh, sector we were supposed to talk about. So if it was history, humanities, or sciences, we would talk about the uh, global goals of the UN. So obviously also about climate change. And then I came back to Belgium uh, and had another three years of education here. And all of a sudden, we were not talking about this anymore. And so I had kind of this shock of differences of how from one day to another, it's like we had solved the climate emergency, the poverty aspect, the inequalities aspect, and that it was something that you would only talk about if you wanted to be engaged. If you want to talk about it uh, over lunchtime with some engaged professors, we could do it around the Amnesty team, the Oxfam team, or others, but it was, it was really not included as something that was part of society. It was something as if you have additional time and you and you have the privilege to get uh, to get engaged, you should do it and you can do it. It's well seen, but it's not more than that. And I think these differences really gave me a shock where I realized, no, we must learn about this and it needs to be included in every single classes uh, whatsoever we want to talk about, because that it, it, it was already mentioned, this is really we need to have a holistic vision of how we want to teach uh, climate change because it touches all sectors. Because whatever sector we are interested in, there is going to be a change in the next 30 years. So we need to make sure that this is included in all these classrooms. And personally, I did not see that yet. Is it coming now slowly? I really hope so, but it must go much faster. And I think it's very interesting to hear mostly how we will give these trainings to teachers also for them for that for them to be uh, to make sure that these trainings are included in um, their you know in, in their work as not something extra on a Saturday on a Sunday or late at night uh, it's not something that is really included for them as a real transition for all teachers across Europe because they will have to talk about this and to go back quickly to the question where you said what if teachers, don't believe because it's not a belief in climate change um actually i i i'm very impressed to see that when there are real trainings that are taught um and and brought forward even to people who question the real impact of climate change there is a real shift there is a real shift from people when we take the time uh, to give trainings and to give them a voice and an opportunity to be part of the conversation during those trainings. So I really think these trainings can be a game changer for teachers and then for them to be really having to include that in their programs. Trainings for teachers. But what opportunities are there? We've got a question from Aurora Gregory 
who wonders how teachers can participate in European exchange programs with other schools to share their knowledge and experiences, maybe. And Michael, what opportunities are there? I mean, exchange, exchange, exchange. I mean, you can do it uh, because, I mean, I would be a bit more optimistic than the tone we had here so far. I mean, first of all, I think uh, it's slowly, slowly coming also as a really important subject in the in the official curricula uh, that, that actually authorities ask this topic to be dealt with in geography, in biology, in citizenship, education, history, wherever. And then, frankly speaking, I also, I mean, teachers are like everybody, are like commission officials. You have better one and you have less good ones. So, I mean, they, 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 I really trust that there are many engaged and good teachers who know what's going on here in the world and to try to, to promote it to their children. And uh, so I would be a bit more optimistic. We are far from getting there, but you have wonderful colleagues who are, who are, who are pushing the, these topics. So these colleagues, if they are then trying to, 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 to find other colleagues and to talk about it, I mean, they can do it, for example, via Erasmus Plus projects. I mean, they can, uh, with the help of the Erasmus Plus agencies um, that we have in all countries, uh, from their school, they can find partner schools from across Europe and to see if you're a partner school, let's say I'm based here in Belgium, is a, if a Belgian school wants to look how do the colleagues in Poland, how do the colleagues in Italy uh, or in Estonia do it, I mean they can find partners and work on a particular subject. The same if that's, you can do it via e-twinning where they can uh, work they can connect via an electronic platform. We've had a year, this as a yearly topic, not for, uh, um, not not a long time ago, where teachers have simply exchanged practice, and that's what, what helps most. Um, and the other thing is the what, what Trema is working on. So you can collect uh, local projects, what the school does with your local authorities, with all sorts of associations, and simply share it. I mean, I really believe in this power of sharing, because it, then the, the ideas spread, and it's also very motivating that you're not alone. I mean, if you're interested in it, you will find your, your peers, you will get new ideas and you will get, get a lot of motivation from, from understanding that you're not alone and you have other people doing the same fight uh, to, across Europe with you. Mm. It's all about signaling to teachers that they're not alone, that there's peers that they can rely on, people that have lived through a similar experience to sort of boost their application. Miriam. Are you guys doing something like connecting uh, climate interested teachers to each other, sharing best practices across the network? How does that work in practice? Like, do you have a set of slides that they're like, hey, show this to your students and they'll start to realize that there's a problem or what do you do? Absolutely. Well, for example, uh, one of uh, uh, these projects that we are collaborating with Life Terra, it's uh, a life project, and we have a Terra Mission Educational Pack, which basically is a set of ready-made lesson plans. Because teachers, at the end of the day, they don't have time to be uh, creating uh, new things. And also, I think the problem right now is not that there are. Uh, there are, it's not that there are enough resources, there are too many. Uh, so the difficult thing is to select the ones that are uh, appropriate for your students. So thanks to this pack, uh, they can easily uh, teach about climate change and other uh, sustainability topics. And what I personally really like, and it's close to my heart, is that there are a lot of outdoor opportunities uh, in this program to get the students uh, to explore the surroundings of the school and to go even further. Uh, so send, thanks to this, uh, teachers are connecting. Uh, we also have a, a massive open online course, so teachers can uh, follow this course at their own tempo. And through this, we also have a big community. They are connecting through social media. And by themselves, uh, they've seen, OK, I have a school quite nearby that I can uh, connect and do things with them or even a little bit further from uh, country to country. And we also provide uh, workshops and opportunities for them to sometimes travel and to get these trainings together. So in fact, uh, there's a big community now uh, really excited to, to go out there and to really learn uh, about nature in nature, which I think is very important. Very fair enough to sort of radically change our topic, moving from teachers to students, right? We've Annalise struck asking the question of how to bridge the gap between knowledge and action on sustainability, because despite the fact that students have acquired a lot of knowledge on sustainability, it seems as they're not acting. If you get my drift, that really puts the focus on students. 
is is the purpose of educators to educate or to inspire action? That's the question that we need to be answering. Adelaide, if I had to ask you as an activist, what role should be edu should educators be playing? It's a it's a very good question. I think uh, today we have come to a stage where bringing awareness on climate change is not um, just about talking about it. It's not enough today as a citizen, no matter the age we have, no matter the role we have in society, to only know about climate change. And so we have to get to the step further because we lost so much time, because it has to go so fast, because we have no time uh, to wait anymore. So we must go further than just consciousness. And because of that, obviously, the role of education and of teachers will go beyond just sharing the fact that, OK, global warming is happening. Now, global warming is happening. And all of us here has a role. We all have a role to make sure to contribute to the change that is needed. And for that, that brings the teachers to the next step of seeing with their students that there is this problem. And together as a class or as a group of friends or as a school or as a city um, or our, as a town, we can organize, we can create, we can work together on seeing how we will contribute to the positive change that needs to happen. And that is happening anyways now. So I think the importance here of teacher is to empower their students. And to do that, it's to propose and co-organize with them projects that will really include them in the change. Because I think what we see today with young people is that obviously they can have the information if they want it. So there are many young people who are very informed about this subject, thanks to technologies, internet, etc. Some of them are, are well informed because they find the right resources. But then if you don't allow them or give them a space for engagement, it can actually be very dangerous because it's at that moment that you find eco anxiety. It's at that moment that you can find depression because of a paradoxical world in which we live in where there is so many crises to be worried about, so many bad news. And at the same time, our everyday life that is trying to look like everything is so beautiful. And I think this paradox is creating this feeling for especially my young generation. And so we need to allow and actually it is part of the role of teachers and of adults and therefore of all of us to empower students and give, a, give them this space to be, to be included in the conversation, in the debate and in the project already management to make sure that they are included in this transition because then they will really accept much more whatever policies uh, that coming to that that will be proposed for change. They will be much more welcoming of any change in society because they will feel included in this change. So yes, obviously the role of teachers is to go much further than just the consciousness. Tremor, you've just taught your class about climate change, and now they've all got climate anxiety. What would you, as an educator of sorts, be teaching your? What is your response to that as an educator? First of all, I've got, we've got to start from the uh, very evident idea that uh, education should be about not uh, what to learn, but how to learn. So this is why the uh, competence-based approach is absolutely key. And I want to say a couple of words on uh, the uh, European Sustainability Competence Framework, which is called Green Cone, because and to go back to what Adelaide was uh, saying, is precisely about that. So let's, for the, at, at the beginning, uh, agree on the fact that a competence is a composition of knowledge, skills, and attitudes. So knowledge is absolutely key. And by the way, Adelaide, I agree with you that you have a lot of young people who, who uh, have got that knowledge, but let's not forget the other one. And I think that's the majority who've got no knowledge still. But knowledge is not, is not enough uh, because I don't want to be negative, Michael, but the reality is that if we are, are considering the figures, uh, UNESCO is telling us that you've got just half of the curriculum in the world that are tackling climate change, that's the reality. If you give, uh, if you take, consider, for instance, the Eco School program, which is uh, proposed by the Foundation on Environmental Education, they are doing an excellent job on defining schemes so that to embed sustainability at the school level, and they've been uh, doing that for 30 years now. 
And they've got 60,000 schools that are doing that program at global level. 60,000 is just the amount of schools you have in France alone. And you have 1.2 million schools in India alone. So that's that just to keep a bit uh, the perspective of, of uh, what's happening. So I go back to the competence-based approach, which is to my view absolutely key, and that's the answer to your question. But we've got to equip the students with these competences, knowledge, skills, and attitudes. And I will take an example coming from Green Camp, which uh, certainly will please very much Adelaide. Uh, one is about a political agency. Um, we need to foster individual initiatives, but also collective actions, uh, in order to give the possibility to, um, to uh, the students uh, to, to really act. Uh, but there's a, a very in, in interesting point uh, on that, which is also that um, they have to identify political responsibility, I'm quoting, on accountability, on unsustainable behaviors, on demand effective policies for sustainability. And here immediately we understand that we're talking about something which is very strong, political agency at that point, which is also very much about democracy, by the way. Uh, so we need thriving democracy uh, with participative processes, with strong citizen engagement and accountable representatives if we have need to have a transition that will be also fair and just. So that, that's, to my view, something which is very interesting on the, uh, to your question. Education systems need to provide that sort of, now of, uh, of, of learning on these competences in order to give to the students the possibility to act as citizens and as professionals. So it, of course, it's a challenge. It's a huge challenge, you will understand, but it's also a chance to my view for Europe and for the future of Europe. So but that therein, I think, lies the very fine difference in challenge in education, right? Where do you draw the line between empowerment, enlightening students, making them aware of challenges, but then where does education end and activism begin, right, as a teacher? I, Michael, do you have any experiences on, with teachers to, uh, addressing this issue, this challenge, right, between education and activism? Hmm. No, I mean, the, 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 it's not the job of the teacher to, 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 uh, to do activism, uh, but it's a really important job of the teachers to tell that this is possible. I mean, that this exists and to also uh, give young people uh, the baggage that they need in order to engage in that if they wish so. Because I mean, in a way, that's, that's I think, exactly as, as Trema said. I mean, the way a good education is, is, is not really just about the knowledge. You cannot do without knowledge, but also how to use the knowledge. So I think that's also when you have climate, that's why the interdisciplinary part is so important. It's geography, it's biology, but it's of course also citizenship education and then why not history? You have other things. So I think what's really important to be because we're talking about anxiety and, and the risk, okay, I'm overwhelmed by these huge challenges um, to also discuss, yes, uh, I mean, what are the possibilities uh, to act so to get a bit away from this idea of being helpless? And there are possibilities to say, yes, there's certain things you can do in your, your own life, when your consumption patterns, think about it. And there are certain things you can do in, 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 in politics, either in classic politics or by other types of associations outside. This exists and it's worth trying. Uh, or you can do something in your professional life. So these are maybe the three things that, that can be discussed at school to, pre to prepare pupils and learners for life, because that's what school is about. You need to prepare for further learning, prepare them for life. And if you then can discuss, um, 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 I mean, if you think this is important, um, this is the options. And then, I mean, I have no problem if they really want to do activism, they should perhaps do it outside in the afternoon after school ends, but in the, in the morning or in the early afternoon when they have courses, they should really discuss, yes, this is, this is something that exists, why it comes that so many people are worried about it, um, uh, what are the issues at stake, and, and why is it so important to discuss this in a democratic uh, context. Um, and, and what are the, the, the power relations and all this. I mean, all this is, requires quite a lot of understanding, which would then, I think, I hope, also help people to engage in these discussions in a more self-confident uh, way. So, Michael, just checking. You think students should not be skipping school on Fridays to demonstrate on behalf of the climate? Oh God, that's not for me. I mean, uh, I don't. <laughs> I think that's. Uh, I I personally quite liked it, but I mean, let the ministers at at home uh, uh, do it. 
but I mean, uh, uh, it's 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 a way. It's it's this typical thing. You break rules in order to attract attention. I mean, in a normal way, if everything was perfect, you wouldn't have need to break the rules. In this case, the students decided to break rules because they found that that uh, that their their um, uh, questions were not sufficiently taking attention. So this is something that that. that happens in political processes, which is fine as a certain extent. As an education person, I would, of course, say at some moment, OK, fine, I have a lot of sympathy, but it's quite good to have uh, to go to school also back at some moment. So I mean, that's that's uh, that's um, uh, yeah, that's what I would see. Fair enough. But <laughs> the thing is, I am based in Berlin, right? A city mm -hmm. that has been, some politicians would say, plagued by the so-called last generation which is a rather extremist central european climate movement that has taken to gluing themselves to streets in response to the climate crisis some of their demands are quite extremists uh, observers and politicians have questioned the intellectual underpinning do you think that this group is what stands before us when we fail to educate properly on climate or do you think it is the proper outcome michael uh sorry miriam sorry <laughs> miriam as a climate educator how would you categorize this grouping, the last generation? Is it the perfect outcome or a, a failure of climate education? I don't know if I will go in one or the other direction, but I will say it's a response to what is happening now. It, it In history, other things have happened that we had to be radical in one moment to change. So I think this extremist um, situation is going to come in the middle, let's say, and we are all going to agree that we have a problem and we're going to go forward together. And like uh, Michael and Tremor were saying, uh, it's already at, at the school level, we are educating in sustainability. It might be a little bit late, but nevertheless, we are doing it and we need to be positive. And I discussed about this um, overwhelming or also this adolescent deep at the age of 14, 16, even perhaps a little bit longer, uh, that they have this anxiety. And I think it's, well, it, 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 it goes to this helplessness, this feeling uh, of not being able to do enough, because I think sustainability at the beginning was taught in a more normative teacher center way instead i think in students should be more involved in sustainability activities so they can see their impact on their immediate surrounding so basically uh you know hands hands on activities that combine scientific concepts so they have the knowledge critical thinking so they can see where are the fake news where i should be putting my time and also active citizenship so basically, we shouldn't be lecture them about why should not, uh, why you shouldn't be throwing away trash at the coast or at the park. But get your students to the coast, to the park. Let them organize um, a cleanup activity, and you can combine this with other learning initiatives, of course. But we should focus on what's happening around us because if we are lecturing them about, you know, polar bears, but I'm in Spain, well, maybe that doesn't sit with them and they see, okay, the world is ending. What can we do? No, we can do a lot of things already around the school. We can start by greenifying school, for example. I think that's something that we might talk about later on. But I think this whole school approach of greenifying your school could be a first a great initiative for them to understand that they have an impact in society as well. I see where you're coming from, Miriam, but if I am a climate anxiety teenager, I'm 17, I think that we're so close to a four degree world. I personally would feel maybe that just greenifying a school may not be enough given the immediacy of the crisis that we're facing, right? Because if, if I am full of anxiety, I think that Mankind, as we know it, is about to end. Adelaide, you are much closer to the youth climate concern movement than I am. Do you think that some of your compatriots, you yourself, would feel satisfied by just greenifying your school? Here, at least for a part of my generation, it's not everyone, obviously, but the parts that is active, they 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 decided to to go beyond their school walls and break their school walls because they realize that being an engaged citizen doesn't only mean being the best student. doesn't only mean to, I mean, it, it is very important to act on your school level and we must do it. And we must have students and teachers that work on it. 
But also we must listen then to these teachers and to these students when they realize that they are blocked because maybe it's not easy without political support to transition because maybe there is no budget for them to green their schools. So this is also important in those kind of projects that are really important and that I support that we must see where they, where they lack of supports because the, the transition will have to be helped structurally. And it's again, just we have to be careful when we talk about these kind of projects to not lay solely the um, responsibility on individuals. And I think what's very interesting with the youth movements ha that have been developed the past years and that are that, that is really growing is that they are constantly talking about a structural change, about something that is not anymore about individual change. So when we talk about uh, educating about climate change, we're not going to talk about the fact that you as an individual should take less the car, you should try to not take uh, the plane too often, try to have less trash. Obviously, that's important, but that's not going to change the world. We've been doing that for the last 50 years, and it still brought us here today. We need structural change. And in the structural change, and we've seen it throughout history, you have more radical movements that bring in this radical message. And it is crucial. You have seen no societal change without those radical movements. So going back to those groups who would, for example, glue themselves on the street, do I think this is good or bad? Well, whatever it is, they're bringing the level of structural change to the center of attention everywhere across the world. And whether we see that as radical or not, it allows the other movements who are seen as less radical to be legitimate in all conversations and to bring in constantly this structural approach to the change that is needed. And so I think today's teachers and students' job, they have to have this responsibility, of course, of, of their kind of local level of, of real change. And it is to, I think it will talk to students to green, to green their schools. It will talk to students to change also the way um, between their relationship between teachers and students. All these local projects are super crucial and we need them. But you will have students, like you're saying, who will want this to see this structural, structural change and who will want to be part of it. They want to be part of this debate whatever the age they are and wherever they are in the EU. And if, they, if we don't include them now, they will be in our streets. They will be blocking the cars. They will be doing many different actions, whatever the creation that we can come up with, because they're not talking, because they're not included. So I think here, these groups, it's not about education. It's not about, like you were asking, is it a failure or not of consciousness? They are very conscious. It's it's not a question of education, it's a question of the democracy and security. And because they're not included in our democracy, not enough, at least they don't feel included. And because they feel unsecured now with the way we're handling this crisis, they react. And thank God they react because it could be, it could be worse. It means that they are engaged citizens and they want to react. They want to be part of it. And I think that's a very a beautiful sign is just that sadly sometimes it's translated as uh, something seen as radical but because they are not in because they are not um, included and i think that today these groups are very needed if we want real changes fair but then the question is really though how much of this change should bleed into society through education right and my understanding of education is that it's the foundations of our society it's the very grassroots it's a decade-old consensus that has been structurally hard fought. Tremor, if I were to ask you, as a seasoned professional, is, edu is structural change something that should already be addressed at the school level, given that democratically there's been no societal consensus on structural change to the extent that Adelaide has been discussing yet? So I'm going to go back to what I was saying before, uh, Nico, because Systems thinking, that's what it is uh, about, is a competence precisely that should be developed and fostered uh, within the uh, the uh, education system. It's part, by the way, of uh, Green Comp and the uh, European Sustainability Competence Framework. So again, it's, a, it's about giving the capacities for the students to know how to act and learn. Uh, and then they do what they want to do. 
as citizens. We want to go uh, for the blue party or the red party, that's that, that, that choice. But they have to act as citizens, so that's what we want. That's what is democracy and democratic education about. We give them the capacities to hack as professionals and citizens. So, and we can then complain about uh, the fact that they want to act as citizens. That's very good. That's excellent. Then we have to, of course, to uh, try to involve them much more, as much as we can, of course, in the uh, decision process, which is, by the way, what your institution are doing more and more. But it also go the other or the other way around. Huh? That's something I want to 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 tell Adelaide. Uh, not all students are like you, Adelaide. That's also a reality. So what we're trying to do, for instance, for education for climate is building capacity with students, teachers, and education stakeholders. What I'm witnessing. So maybe you will tell me it's because of communication issues on that. But you might be right, by the way. But I mean, the fact is that we are more struggling to get involved uh, with students involved than adults, professionals coming from uh, NGOs, associations, or, or teachers. So how do we uh, have that conversation on that co-construction process together is, to my view, what we need to do now. And to go beyond also, you know, like you were saying, uh, Adelaide, uh, the uh, protest movement, which is uh, important, raise awareness, but now to co-construct solutions together. And to my view, that's something which is uh, really where we are at the moment, and I see institutions, I see uh, absolutely ready for that. So uh, let's work on it because uh, uh, this is it. Co-constructing solutions. Michael, what are you doing to co-construct the solutions? I mean, the, the I think structural change is actually being worked on. I mean, I, I really uh, mentioned at the introduction that uh, we have the Green Deal in the European Union. And, and of course, there are people working on how to make agriculture de uh, greener, how to preserve biodiversity, um, how to, to work on green transport system, how to change our energy systems. But this is huge. And of course, you don't change this from one day to the other. And I think what we can do in education is to, to also show uh, the different possibilities to act. I mean, there may be people who want to act locally and at their school because they can immediately um, show uh, the results and see the results. Uh, but there may be others who say, listen, we have, uh, you, for example, European Parliament election next year. And there you can look at the programs of different parties. You may want to support one or the other party because they, you think they have the, the right approach. And then you, it takes a long time and long efforts to, to go through all these, these, uh, uh, these, um, these processes because, I mean, we really need change of our societies and economies and we need this to be done in a democratic way. It's not because we perhaps believe that climate change is important that other peoples would fully share that all the time. So we have to, to discuss with others and to get majorities for it. And this takes a lot of time. And also this, this, um, this, this part has to be also discussed in education. I mean, what are the opportunities in, in democracies? How do democracies work? What are the, the, the possibilities you have and what are the results you can expect to have in a few months and what are the results you can expect um, a bit longer time and it sometimes also needs a bit of a long breath to get the results and, and, and there are possibilities all the time as I say you more some people go for the for the for the local bus system and others and uh, you may become uh, in your local uh, municipalities others may go to a countrywide level or a European level and all of this their education can show the opportunities that are there and also to be a bit to, to also make clear that about this this patience of course i i mean we need a bit also to understand that that some people may disagree with that and then you have to deal how do you deal with this disagreement and then and that has to be done now in, in in our ways and in a democratic way and that's also part of the discussion not to be in order to avoid frustration and violence and anything else yeah I think you broached a very important topic of getting majorities. On this topic, we have a question from Paul Lim to Miriam's particularly. So he's wondering to what extent your work reaches out to rural village students and schools, because to his mind, the, our entire discussion is a very city people discussion. We're sitting here in our online web call and we talk about climate education. We talk about the last generation, but he wants to wonder how does your work reach out to these rural students? 
Miriam. Absolutely. And uh, I think it's a very good question. We have the pleasure to be working with many teachers around Europe and the reality is very different. Not everybody has a classroom with 12 students and one uh, interactive whiteboard and everything is, you know, clean and pretty and everything's good. No, we also have teachers that are teaching in the mountains and then they don't have any science centers that they can go visit around. We also have uh, um, you know, teachers that are overwhelmed because suddenly they have to take on 40 students in one classroom. So again, uh, the reality of each teacher and each school, it's very different. Um, this is, well, in Europe, uh, this is also the virtue of having different cultures and different um, countries at once. So we are trying to solve the same issue, but not everybody is starting from the same um, starting point. So we also need to adapt how we are bringing up this message uh, to, to the different teachers. Because if an educator is already struggling with managed to get the day by because he has 40 students and he has no absolutely no material about sustainability then his priorities are others so you have to approach it in a different way than someone that it's already very climate minded oh, we have to do something about this i have all my materials how can i engage my students even more so we are working with different uh, educators and we are trying to give them um, the knowledge, the skills, and the attitudes to transfer to students as uh, as they need. So we are not doing it the same as uh, one in in the city as someone in the rural area, of course. And I would like to also bring uh, the concept of nature-based solutions because uh, I think this is very important. How to harness the power of nature? So instead of you know trying to solve uh, sustainability issues with uh, you know, building concrete walls instead of, for example, bringing the natural flow of a river how it used to be. This is something that students feel very connected with. And it also goes back to, well, in a rural area, uh, if you go protest on the streets, there's not much coverage to that. But on the other hand, if you are cleaning up the forest, so you are learning about how to prevent a fire forest, that's also much more meaningful. Fair enough. But ultimately, my understanding is that this comes down to resources, right? Of course. And when we look at resources, schools are stretched thin for resources. So should there be extra resources made available to schools and educators by governments, by administrations, in order to ensure that this is being able to be done? Adelaide, you what's what would you be what would your immediate take be? I mean, I don't know if I'm the, the best person, person to answer this because obviously everybody would say that there's always a need of more budget. So, oh yes, of course, uh, there is a need of uh, structural support for teachers in their way to bring in this education. And therefore, obviously, yes, a budget too. But I think if this budget is not there yet here today, and maybe the others better answer this question than me because... This is uh, more your focus, but um, I think what I've heard at least from the teachers is that because it's not obliged from them to talk about climate change, to teach their students about it, um, it's not in the program you know, that they receive at the end of the, of the year, your student needs to note these things. Well, it's always a plus, and it's always seen as then either a burden to add this to your calendar, um, or, you know, some, some teachers are trying to, to find nice ways to bring it up, but it's always only then teachers that are very motivated that will do it and that then have the privilege because they have maybe a bit more capacity, a bit more resources in their schools to be able to do that. If we want to bring this to all the schools, whatever the resources they have, it needs to be included in the program that teachers must talk about the climate change, must, you know, create one project per year with their students. Um, and then obviously then that will have to include or, or that then the, the resources that a school has will need to include then this part of climate change. So I think it's a bit of a, a two way, but I, for sure, one of the, the way, the fastest way I see it for the moment is to include directly in the program the fact that it's obliged for students to be able to have that knowledge at the end of the year, uh, whatever the course is. So, 
Trent or Michael, do you think that curriculums or let's say I am about to graduate, I'm about to do my Abitur in Germany. Do you think one of the questions should be what's the what has been the particular development of CO2 particles in the air, for example? Do you think that that should be so deeply enshrined in education that it would literally be asked on your final graduation question? Listen, I think I would very much agree with what you're saying, Adelaide. I mean, education should be about relevant knowledge and competences. And I would be shocked to see that this topic is not being taught or discussed. How exactly should it be in the final exam? But I would be really surprised uh, and really negatively surprised uh, to hear it again nowadays in 2023 that someone tells me I've done geography, I've done biology, I've done civics. And we have never discussed these issues. I mean, that would be really bad education because education for me is about the topics of today. And I think this is clearly a topic uh, uh, of today. Like you should discuss this, you should discuss migration, you should, you should discuss digitalization. So it's part of that. And if it's not in there, it's a real scandal. Uh, so that's pretty clear. And then it's up to teachers and good teachers who will say, see, see how to do it. As you say, you need to know a little bit how does the the world uh, work. I mean, you need to do maybe to, to know something about fake news that are being produced. Or you need to recognize fake news and you should discuss what can be done because this is one of the big conflicts in our nowadays society. So how can we deal with it democratically? How can we engage? I will, if I may, 10 seconds on the rural areas. I mean, the rural areas will to come back on that. I mean, they are suffering it today. I mean, you see the droughts. We are just read an article now about Spain, the southwest of Spain, where there's lots of vegetable food production in Huelva on strawberries, and strawberries need a lot of water. So we have a conflict apparently in this region of Huelva between the strawberry producers on the one hand needing lots of water and the nature protection reserve somewhere, which also where the water comes from. Um, and this is something which you have to find where the people are suffering, both the people needing from the nature protection, but also the agriculture workers who, of course, and the enterprise who want to need of it. And that has to be solved in a democratic way. It's a wonderful example where you could discuss with pupils where the problems lie and where they, they how they need to be solved in a certain way. So I really, I would actually say maybe there's activism, but I see many, many pupils and students from the agricultural, from rural areas who are the first one to suffer from drought and, 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 and the diverse effects that we already see nowadays on climate change. You would say droughts hit different when your family is farmers, I suppose, right? They're much more closely connected to the impacts of climate change mm -hmm. and extreme weather events when you're more connected to agriculture, etc. Definitely there. But there's been a question in the chat that has raised a very interesting conundrum to my mind by Veronique Renard, which is asking how to reconcile teaching sustainable slash green education with the fact that many schools are very purely insulated and don't have sustainable cooling systems. Sometimes they don't have a heat pump, etc. What I'm saying is, can schools still lead by example education wise, even though they're horrible from a buildings and climate perspective? Tremor, if I had to ask you, does it like should a school be teaching by example that renovations, the renovation wave, as the EU puts it, is crucial to climate action? Or can it teach irregard regardless of its state as a building? The you know, question applies to institutions as a whole, to tell the truth. Uh, one of the things which is uh, promoted by the Council recommendation on uh, learning for the green transition that Michael was talking about at the beginning is perfectly in line with the UNESCO recommendation of having a whole institution on whole school approach. And that means precisely that, uh, to answer your question, that I mean, if we uh, want to the, the, the students to develop some systemic thinking, for instance, and at the same time, we are doing that in buildings where, as a matter of fact, we don't apply that sort of thinking uh, in the processes that uh, we have. I mean, obviously, that does not make sense. So this is the way to go. Uh, I fully agree with that. Uh, schools should uh, uh, let the example and apply to themselves in their processes. I mean, they are learning uh, that they uh, they uh, want to promote. And that, by the way, Nico, applies to everything. I mean, uh, I've always, uh, as a teacher myself for 20 years, I mean, uh, I strongly believe in the fact that everything that happens in the schools has to be related to learning. You've got to learn something. 
So uh, obviously, uh, it means if you're living, for instance, in a democratic society and you're in a school, I mean, democracy is not something that you're going to learn in a course on democracy, but you apply democracy to the processes of the schools, and then you raise uh, young uh, citizens uh, who are, are becoming uh, democrats. The same thing applies to sustainability. That's exactly the same thing. And I remind you something, Nico. Uh, we have eight competence, key competences at uh, EU level. And one could say, there's not one on sustainability. And precisely for that reason, sustainability is everywhere. It's totally transversal. So it's not about even having a new box on sustainability because you have sustainability everywhere. And if we, you want to have students who become fully sustainable citizens, I mean, you have to apply that sustainability approach in all the processes. So not only in the math uh, or biology lesson, but also when they go at the canteen. And, uh, and uh, if I may, I wanted to add, to, to add something to what Mariam was saying, because she was explaining rightly that we tend to have administration level a view of uh, education, and that's the same thing in the public opinion, that is a bit the same thing everywhere, which is ob obviously absolutely not true. I mean, every school is different, uh, and every teacher is in a different way. Um, so there is no silver bullet. We won't, at EU level or at national level or at regional level, whatever the uh, decisional level is, uh, come up with a solution saying, guys, we've got the solution, you stick to the plan, and that's done. It won't be the case. So they will localize, of course, the solution we provide. And uh, this is why we need to work also the other way around. It's not just providing uh, the capacities and, and the competences to teachers and, and learners so that they can learn about sustainability. It's also for the administration and policymakers and policy officers to think about that diversity. This is why, and I insist in that, that in terms of policy making process, we need to have that encounter very closely between the people who are designing the policies and the ones who are the acting on the ground, so students and teachers. And that way, we will design solutions that fit the real need, and then we will have a, a, an impact in what we are developing. And that, that's really the spirit of a community of practice, such as Education for Climate. I'm so glad to see that it's fully supported at the Open Commission, because it's a very innovative way. Uh, I'm serious in that. I'm not doing, uh, I see you smiling. You say, I'm doing publicity. No, it's an invitation for uh, really for public administration to go that way and to work on a basis of a policy making process which is fully participative because we know it will have a more sustainable uh, result um, impact. Uh, thank you, Trema. I think that's in a way a sort of perfect closing word. As we're heading to close, we've got eight minutes left. You guys are four people. I want you to come up for two minutes, your vision of education 10 years down the line. Starting from the from the person that we introduced last, Miriam, and then going in the reverse order of introduction. How will education be changed in 10 years, given the immediate or immediacy of the climate crisis? I will envision a school, not as uh, four walls and the learning happening inside, but more as a, a connection with the community and also with the outdoor reality. I'm very passionate about outdoor education and I think uh, sustainability should start from a very early age. Schools having open doors, uh, slight, slight doors, so uh, children can go outside, they can play and they can explore and, and learn in nature. And this will also translate into the uh, future generations, because if you, from a very, very young age, you start learning uh, about something, you start caring about it. And when you care about something, you will protect it. So I think my vision for, for schools and education is to start early and to place sustainability in the hearts of students. So when they get older and they get more knowledge and the skills and the attitudes, they can be uh, active citizenships and they uh, active citizens and they can protect um, our environment. A very enlightened perspective, very in line with our opening can quote, Adelaide as the activist or most activist among us, I don't know about the activism grade of the others, but how do you see education changed? Well, first of all, I, I want to support totally what Miriam has put forward. And so I support this, uh, this school in 10 years. Um, and so maybe what I can add uh, to this uh, already ideal school 
uh, would be that, at least personally, what allowed me to continue to want to be interested in the change that is needed to face climate change and other crises that we're facing today is because I feel part of a group, of a community, because I feel part of a project and I feel like... Uh, you know, um, at 22 years old, you can change the world, you know? And at that moment, then you will get engaged. Then you will not let go. Then you will continue to learn because you want to learn because you realize that when you learn, actually it gives you more uh, empower to to be part of the, com of the conversation. And so I hope in the ideal is to add on to the school that has already been presented with projects where students feel like they are parts of the change already. Because as soon as they feel this power inside them, this empowering, they will continue after the school. They will continue outside of the school's uh, uh, borders. And then maybe we didn't touch, touch upon that today enough. I think education is not only about uh, young people and so, and teachers. I think education is, uh, goes also, of course, beyond schools. And I wonder how we continue and should continue to educate all adults, whatever sectors, um, to make sure that actually this transition will go even faster to not wait upon the, the next generation. Very fair. Tremor, your vision. So uh, I would have a, 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 a two visions in a way, because there's a bright side of, of, of life on the, on the dark side. Um, but I agree that the 10 years that are coming are absolutely key. Uh, they are not just key for education, they are key for the transition. I really want to, uh, tell, to uh, reach the objective, the very ambitious uh, objective we have uh, in terms of climate neutrality. The 10 years window that uh, is open in, in all of us is, is super important. So if things go according to plan and recommendation, uh, we will have education system that will understand that they've got to bring that, break down a bit the, the walls uh, physical and, and virtual, and the virtual one are the, 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 the most solid one, uh, to open themselves to the relation with the community around and innovation. And for that, we need to give the freedom, the right freedom and the trust to the teachers and the students to feel really empowered and together to uh, co-construct solutions. I think we can go that way uh, if we can give them that, that these capacities by opening really uh, the system to uh, exchange and, uh, and, and again, trust to give them the possibility to experiment uh, innovation. Uh, that would be the, the bright side and the, and the perfect solution. Uh, if we don't do that, and it's not just about climate change decor, think about artificial intelligence, changing very, very fast on learning, exchanging information uh, is totally changing. Internet was the first shot, but uh, intelligence, artificial intelligence will be another one. What we could have at that point is that we will have systems that won't adapt, won't evolve really, where you will have a lot of students and teachers that will be blocked in systems that are outdated, but are not updated, upcycled to uh, the new reality. And the yappy few who will be in very good schools, uh, will learn uh, with uh, wonderful patterns, processes, and everything, or people that will even be, will be. Uh, outside the school trying to learn uh, for themselves and, uh, and maybe uh, uh, being able to do that or not. So it means something where you will have, of course, different uh, chances on the, on the, for the people, for the students, to learn or not to learn uh, and get the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the right competencies for the transition, which would be a disaster and not something fair. So, but there is a risk, to my view, that that uh, sort of inequality can increase if we don't react uh, at the right uh, time. The bright side and the dark side uh, of life. Michael, you've got 30 seconds. Yeah, big question. Um, well, the, I, what the ideal situation is where learners and teachers are happy to be in school and that they feel that this is really worth a lot of efforts to prepare for further life and for further learning, because as we've heard, it continues afterwards, and that the learners feel that they got this. How do they get it? Um, interdisciplinarity, combining knowledge with doing things. Uh, teachers are well prepared. They get support. We ask a lot of them, but they also work together. Very important. 
uh, schools and learning institutions work with partners outside of it. And if you put these factors together, I think then the people will be prepared for further life and they will enjoy it. And I think they will also be able to look beyond their 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 their, their community that they know. I mean, their, their own family, their, their municipality their countries, but also have an international dimension of it, which I think is also very important uh, in this whole debate that we look at our own country, but also have a European and global perspective to this. That would be my vision. Very fair. I think we've all learned a lot. I certainly have. It's been a very pleasant discussion for me personally. I've learned the fact that ultimately education is very much about empowerment and about the transdisciplinarity of the sustainability and the climate challenges facing us. My understanding is that this, this discussion is now coming to an end. We'll have this confirmed with production, but I thank you very much. Remember, it's the hashtag EA Debates on Twitter. Thank you all for participating on Slido. We weren't able to take all questions, but we've been reading the discussion. You guys have all been very vocal and very interested. It's been a pure joy to see you guys pitching in. I think the interest in the debate has shown how timely this debate is and how immediate the question of education, given the challenge that we're facing, is. And yes, stay true to us, hashtag EADebates, and we'll see you all next time.